All right, uh, back-to-back trading days in a market getting shellacked, for lack of a better word. The main issue, China, uh, of course, is the narrowing yield curve and all of the uncertainties with the Federal Reserve. Uh, but the economic data, a lot of it out today, and the all-important jobs mar- report uh, tomorrow will be released. Here to discuss it all, and maybe we can get some answers, is Clear State Advisor, Senior Managing Director, Jim Awad, Bonson Group Managing Partner and Founder, David Bonson, and Fox Business's Susan Lee. Uh, let's just start with the, the news that had, um, it hit late yesterday, uh, but ironically, the, uh, the arrest of the CFO of Huawei happened on Sunday, Susan. Give us a breakdown of, of how these events played out. So December the 1st, and uh, you know, Huawei, I would say, has had a strained relationship with the U.S. government. There have been accusations that Huawei is actually a conduit for Chinese spying in the country, and uh, they have had contracts with some questionable governments, including in Syria. They worked with Egypt and now Iran. This is the uh, the actual basis for this arrest of the CFO of the company, which is, by the way, one of the largest technology companies in China, but also the daughter of the founder. So I would, I would compare Huawei to like a Microsoft or a Dell in China. Boring business, but they make a lot of money. Now, you know, some would say that this is a really a sign of the escalation in tensions. China, of course, has hit back saying they are angry about this. And, uh, you know, this is not part of the 90-day trade truce. And, you know, how fragile is that agreement? But, David, don't you find it interesting that if it happens Sunday, obviously, President Trump and President Xi is sitting across from each other. They know this is going down. Uh, and, and, and since then, uh, you know, we've had yesterday we had more corroboration from the Chinese government. Uh, yeah, the 90 day truce is there. We'll buy LNG. We'll buy uh, uh, soybeans. And we are endeavoring to fix this. Well, I'm not sure that they've caught, that they've substantiated that they did know on Sunday. It had happened on Sunday, but I'm not sure that we've gotten confirmation either that the White House knew or right. that, that they knew in China. Either way, you heard John point. Bolton just told the NPR NPR News that uh, he knew in advance of this arrest. And so I think that what you have is what you exactly what you said, the sign of, of greater escalation, but it's more the overall narrative, the narrative being uncertainty about what exactly is going to happen. I agree. I still am optimistic a deal gets done where it made progress in 90 days. But I'm, I'm sorry. The president's tweet on Tuesday was not encouraging. It was not responsible. It adds to this narrative that we don't know exactly how this ends. And the yield curve is not an additional problem. The yield curve is reflecting this problem. You know, Jim, uh, I think everyone agrees that that tweet was an unnecessary bogey. Uh, There was a, a lot of good feelings. And by the way, For me, there's a lot of people in my mind who really are rooting against President Trump, I hate to say it, on Wall Street for a variety of reasons. So whenever he gives them this sort of ammunition, they can change the subject. Uh, uh, And and, and he gives it to them sometimes, and I understand he needles them, whatever, but it didn't help on Tuesday. What are you saying now is the major issues here? All right, so the major, on the, on the China trade, you've got to understand that Trump is running for re-election. He, he measures himself on the stock market. The stock market is very important to him. He likes to... Obviously, it's not as important, though, as some of these other issues because... I mean, if he cared about, if, if the market was the most important thing, he, we would never get those kind of tweets. We probably would never but, have had this great time. war in the first place. He's got time. I think he wants to play good cop, bad cop, keep the Chinese a little bit off balance. But if you look around the curve, when it's all said and done, he wins if he can declare victory and, and hug the Chinese and say, we won and we love the Chinese. And the Chinese are looking for a face-saving way to get out. So I think they're compelled ultimately to deal with each other, but there's going to be a lot of uncertainty in the process. Huawei issues go back a long time, Susan. Long you time. mentioned that. Uh, there was a, a report in a, in a South China Morning Post that, uh, that uh, Sabrina Ming and her father had a, had a big meeting with their employees, and they discussed a lot of these things. They said that American companies were too compliant, and that there were times that they would violate regulations and these sanctions and simply pay the fines as a cost of doing business, not unlike UPS getting a parking ticket in New York City. They just never took this stuff seriously, so maybe this was an overdue message. Well, yes, the New York Times have done a number of reports over the years, going back to 2016, 2017, uh, saying that uh, Huawei is an example of how companies might be able to skirt some of the the economic sanctions in terms of dealing with governments that the U.S. government doesn't want you to do business with. Having said that, though, ZTE paid a billion dollar fine. I mean, that was a signal to Huawei that you can't always go against the rules. That was it. But see, that's what they were saying, though. That's what the, the meeting was about. Listen, let's keep doing these things, and when we have to occasionally, we'll pay a fine. It's the cost of doing business. But President Trump, to your point, got a lot of pushback on that ZTE deal. It's not... It's 
that's it's right. interesting because Marco Rubio and Tom Cotton both have legislation in there to stop Huawei from doing any business in this country. Maybe he was listening to those political tea leaves as well. Well, perhaps. But what's interesting is at least with the ZTE thing, the billion dollars was a real fine that was really paid by China to the U.S. The president keeps talking about how we're getting this money from China. We're not. It's a U.S. importers paying the tariffs. I like the fines better. I'm tired of the intellectual property theft. We've talked about this before. Let's stop it. The fines get the message. The tariffs do not. Real quick, guys, aside from this, we have factory orders in. They were down 2.1%, not much lower than what the street expected. <laughs> ISM services number was a phenomenal right. number. Yeah. Phenomenal. The only thing that was down of 18 industries, agriculture. International yes. trade, though, came in significantly worse. Our largest deficit in history right, that was subtract. China. That, and that will subtract from yeah. GNP. But I, I had an opportunity yesterday to spend some time in a small group with uh, Brian Moynihan, who I put in the same class as Jamie Dimon, and he just got back from Argentina, and he tells me he's got a pulse on the economy. He tells me it's slowing, but it's not serious, that, that uh, we're going to grow at something like 2.7 next year, down really? to 3 this year. And we are slowing, but, but we're going to slow to a level that's above the averages under Obama. All right. Going to bring all you guys back a little bit later. I want to switch gears here, Jim, David, and Susan. Heading into the final hour of trading, the Dow down a little less than 400 points. Back with me, Jim A. Watt and David Bonson. Hey, guys, I want to ask you about a conversation I had with uh, Keith Fitzgerald earlier, uh, based in part on a tweet that I got. Someone was saying, it's a time to just ban algorithms. What do you think, David? Um, I think I learned the hard way in late 2008 when they banned the short selling about the law of unintended consequences. I'm not a statist. This is not a government intervention deal. There's a lot of disruptions going on. I'm more concerned with some of the disruptions locations in the ETF market. I don't think banning algorithm trading is going to do what people want it to do. I think it's a yeah. bad idea. You know, ultimately, it'll stop working at some point. Everybody's doing the same That's thing. Right. It's very hard to do it differently than the next person. If you get back to portfolio insurance in, in 1987, it stopped working. So it went away. So at some point, it's going to stop working. It'll get down as a percentage. Certainly of the architects of it, or who are the folks employing it, whether it's, it's quants, whoever they are, can't want the market to go down 800 points. I mean, you know, it feels like it's there's 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 some overreactions going on. It feels like one program triggers another program, which in turn triggers another program. And maybe it's the law of unintended consequences. No one could want this, could they? Well, no, but I think that, that when you're talking about traders who need speed, they are not so much concerned with direction, right? It's, it's, there's a whole other kind of profit motive going on. It really, to me, I talk to my clients about this a lot. If we care about things swinging one way or the other within an hour, then that's on us. We should not care about it. We need to stay disciplined to what we're trying to do from the vantage point of real goals as an investor. These guys don't get in the way of that. Fundamentals win in the end yeah. always. You take, if you're a fundamentalist, you take advantage That's right. of the opportunities created on both the buy and the sell side from these programs because they tend to make the market go up more than it should and get down more than That's it right. should. And if you just keep your guy on your asset allocation yeah. and, and when they kill the market, buy it. And when they take it up too much, lighten up right. a little bit, you could... That's easier said than done since you guys are pros. By the way, I agree. I've, been, I've made a lot of money in the last three weeks selectively. You know, a couple of names I love got very cheap. We got in and got out a lot sooner than I normally would have. But for the average person out there who wants to be involved in the market, is it, is it for the general public, though, is it too much to endure? Well, first of all, for the general public, the bid-ask spreads are narrower than they've ever been in history. So there is a more efficient trading that has come as a result of a lot of this increased volume and activity. But no, I think that the general public who's not being properly advised or counseled that gets whipsawed like this, this can be very dangerous. And, and, and these guys can add to that, but they add to it mo both directional. As, what as about the point. uptick rule? Yeah. The well, I, I'm, I was never on the floor or, or in that part of the business. Yeah. There were some very smart guys like Lee Cooperman today came came out and said he thinks it should be abolished. There's a case for putting it back in, uh, in, in, in on the books. But I, again, I think I think the economics will make this phenomena go away. Eventually, you'll find these people are selling at the bottom and buying at the top and that active management will, will supplant them and it'll stop being an economic enterprise. My problem with the uptick rule is that it acts as if by getting rid of it we would do something real significant. It probably was a bad idea when they got rid of it at the time, but has it really moved the needle? No, and I think it's more symbolism than substance. Let's talk about tomorrow's jobs report. What's the Goldilocks number where the economy is strong enough but it doesn't suggest that the Fed will have to hike rates more than the street already anticipates? 
Uh, 200,000 is the consensus, so you could call that the Goldilocks number. I think you're going to be somewhere in that range. But I really do think that the Fed right now has signaled to us not just what, what Chairman Powell said last week, but even further comments from governors since then. They're backing down a bit. Yep. And, and I think they need to raise in December. They cannot let their credibility be undermined like that. It would, it would usher. That's a foregone panic. conclusion. Foregone. Yeah, the market yeah. would get down if they didn't Abs- raise. In absolutely. September. They got to raise in December, but then perhaps pull back what they're anticipating if in 2019. We get 3.1% wage growth tomorrow. Uh, you know, that the, the, remember, February. February 2nd, the January jobs report showed 2.9 percent. That was the first fear, first time this year Wall Street lost its mind over the fear that the Fed was going to go too far. Yeah, but, you, but since then, you've had an economy that's showing increasing signs of slowing down and inflation expectations coming Way down. lower. And it's a rear-looking number. Oil is so also at $50. Dollars. Oil has come in quite oh, a bit. Oh, by the way, you loved oil last time, about a month ago. It was around in the 70s. You thought it was going to go higher. What no, happened? No, 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 no. This is very important. Okay. I love energy infrastructure. Okay. Commodity agnostic. Oil at 50, oil at 70. It doesn't have anything to do with what we want to be invested in. Natural gas is up 35% in the last seven weeks. Okay. What we want is to export gas to China and to have the companies that will make money doing that. Oh, that's music to everyone's ears. Amen. Folks,